When men like Thomas Sowell, Dr. Ben Carson, and Clarence Thomas are labeled sellouts, coons, Uncle Toms, bootlickers, are we doing more harm to black culture than good? These men have overcome incredible obstacles to achieve greatness, yet their stories are often dismissed due to their political affiliations. In this episode, we want to explore the damaging effects on how these labels stifle black excellence and how it's crucial to learn from their inspiring journeys. Also, who are setting the terms and conditions for who is a sellout? Who is Uncle Tom? Who is a coon? And I want to ask, are these terms and conditions coming within the culture or outside the culture? What's going on, y'all, man? Welcome or welcome back to the Broken Traditions Podcast. On this episode, I want to put a disclaimer out there right i know you guys may see the title may see the thumbnail may get triggered because it mentioned the the men that i mentioned in the cold opening right i want you guys to listen to this podcast in its entirety before making judgment if you listen to this podcast in entirety and you still have that the the pre-judgment the prejudice that you had when you seen the thumbnail and you seen the title then let me know in the comments but if you could listen to this full episode in entirety and still and you don't have that prejudgment let me know also know in the comments right and if you don't have the prejudgment and you do understand where i'm coming from on this episode please share this episode i believe that this episode um it's not a trending topic it's a thought provoking conversation something i want to bring to the table and have a conversation with you guys about and i want to get your guys opinion and how you feel about it and um we can have a discussion within the comments and also I'm going to talk about it more at the end of the episode, but I'm going to start doing a live stream once a month and we could also have a conversation about that too, but I'm going to get to that later. You know, um, the terms, right? Tom, uh, Uncle Tom, sellout, coon, um, bootlicker, uh, new one that I heard, <laughs> Auntie Ruckus, <laughs> a play on Uncle Ruckus. Um, shout out to Messi Michonne, man. What a great content creator i've i've seen that she said you know people start calling her that because she don't have the same democratic talking points uh within within her content and people don't like it right people don't like it so people call her auntie ruckus but what did who set the terms and conditions of who's a sellout you know all these all these derogatory terms that are being labeled on to black people for not having I guess the the status quo kind of mindset right and when i say the status quo kind of mindset not saying all black people have this mindset but the mindset of liberal extreme liberal talking points you know i'm saying whatever the the democrats is pushing if you push something against it you will sell out or if you push something perhaps it's not a victimhood culture like the reason why i'm being called sell out or a white-minded that's another thing i heard white-minded if you don't have those same talking points of the victimhood you're white-minded right let me give you two examples with me um i did a video about andre fortson and roger fortson right uh quick recap yeah roger fortson was the airman that was killed by police in florida right andre fortson is roger fortson's younger brother who was killed by street violence in atlanta and these two men or these two young men or this mother lost two of her sons months apart and i was saying how you know it's a tragedy all around it's a tragedy but i was saying how you know roger fortson's story goes to the narrative of police brutality and how andre fortson narrative is just about you know another black person shot within street violence it's same old story regular schedule programming nobody really cares so i'm saying it's kind of messed up that unfortunately these stories get swept under the rug even though we're talking about somebody who lost his life to police and a few months later his brother lost his life to street violence i'm saying that both stories should be just as big because according to the cdc black people are killed 22 times a day in the united states from street violence so we have a real problem when black people getting killed 22 times a day and 
somebody was upset about that. I said that, and somebody said that I'm a sellout coon for speaking about black on black violence. And I'm like, so me, a black person, speaking about being concerned about black people killing black people, make me a coon. And he did. He also subscribed. We don't. I guess we don't have any conversations no more. Oh, in the next video, I talked about Tyreek Hill police encounter and the coddling of the people online or the people on TV or on Fox Sports, ESPN, the coddling of Tyreek Hill, right? The episode wasn't about Tyreek Hill per se. It was about the coddling of Tyreek Hill and how they make excuses for Tyreek Hill. And somebody in the comments, again, called me white-minded. I'm like, white-minded? Because I said that Tyreek Hill should have handled it differently and how people are trying to hold Tyreek Hill hand. And I'll play clips of, you know, Cameron and Mace, it is what it is. And I also play clips of uh, Nightcat with Chad Johnson and Shannon Sharp and all four of men agree what I was saying. Also, Tyreek Hill later on came out and said that himself, he should have conducted himself differently. But I was white, white minded. So I'm talking about five other men, one man that was in the situation say the same thing I'm saying. But you know what I'm saying? Conversations like that lead for dismissing the point and when you leave for dismissing the point you lose out you know what I'm saying you lose out on hearing real sound judgment or just a common sense a common sense answer on a lot of situations and the common sense answer on situations could be situations for you to get out for you not to find yourself in those situations so the Tyreek Hill situation the Fortson Brothers situation like I said, Missy Michonne and other content creators who just lean a certain direction politically, right? Are called sellouts or dismissed for whatever reason. And I think that's problematic because still sharpen stills. And when you have those conversations, those conversations usually lead into positive results, not negative results, right? Dominique Foxworth saying that this is what it is to be a black man in America, seeing what Tyreek Hill went through, a black man in the McLaren that's an NFL superstar is not what black men go through in America. So those conversations are problematic, but the conversations that give you common sense answers are solutions. So that's why I'm saying when you put those labels on people, sell out Coon, Uncle Tom, what have you, it messes up the dynamic of course correction, right? So... Let me give you two stories on how this really starts sparking in my head from two things I've seen. First thing, right? The book behind me, Rising from the Rails by Larry Rye, talks, speaks about the Pullman Porters. The Pullman Porters were um, men who worked in the railroad for George Pullman, black men who worked in the railroad for George Pullman, and George Pullman business model was to hire black men because black men just came out of slavery and they will work for less money in worse conditions, right? And this was like one of the main jobs that black men could get. This job was so impactful within the black culture back then that doctors that was in between coming a doctor were working as a Pullman porter. Lawyers, same thing. So this job was kind of like the stepping stone for black men to get to that next level of professionalism or just have a job that didn't require high school education or what have you to provide for your family, right? And it's also just the only job that was hiring black men. Um, it's a double-edged sword. I mean, I, if you want, if you guys want more of a detailed story about the Pullman Porters, let me know in the comments. But it's a double-edged sword because, yeah, he was only hiring black men. But like I said, the conditions that black men were going through to work were not ideal at all. Like, it was horrible. But it's a long, it's, it's a great story. It's a great history piece. And I think we need to start doing more history pieces within this channel. I'm going to start implementing that. If you guys want that, excuse me, you guys want that, let me know in the comments or let me know via email, Laron at brokentraditions.com. It was a, a, a person that was brought up in the book, E.D. Nixon, right? E.D. Nixon was a Pullman porter. Like I say, he worked on the railroad, so that means you travel for months at a time as a Pullman porter. Also, E.D. Nixon was a civil rights activist in Alabama. E.D. Nixon was the person who started and organized the Montgomery bus boycott. The most impactful, successful 
form of protest during the civil rights movement in black history. The bus, the Montgomery bus boycott. He organized it. He put it together. He, he was the one that, you know, said that Rosa Parks was the one for this, this, uh, this cause, right? Because Rosa Parks was the first, second, or third. She was the fourth. She was the fourth one, but she's the one that fit the the perfect characteristics for this, right? So, Edie Nixon organized it, but he could not stick around because back then activists would not pay millions of dollars to be activists. Not like today, right? Not like today. So you were not getting paid millions of dollars. So he had to go back on the rails, work as a Pullman Porter. So Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was selected to lead this. From what I understand, I think Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Edie Nixon might have had some, you know, differences and grievances. And people started to refer Edie Nixon the man who organized the Montgomery bus boycott, a Tom, a sellout. How in the world, the man who organized the Montgomery bus boycott, a sellout, how did that happen? Like I said, I, I talked about personal experiences of how a Tom, a sellout was called to me because I had talking points. I guess I wasn't victimization. But a man who organized the Montgomery bus boycott was a sellout? How? The most impactful form of boycott in black American history who organized that as a sellout. Ain't no telling where we would be at right now was it for Edie Nixon's organization of the Montgomery bus boycott. Ain't no telling. But he's a sellout. Who create the terms and conditions of sellouts? Because if y'all could make him a sellout for, for just having a disagreement with Martin Luther King Jr., from what I understand, y'all make anybody a sellout just to, for the slightest things. Now, I want to take it to another story, and I want to take that story to me explaining why calling people sellouts and dismissing these people's stories is problematic. Dr. Ben Carson. A few years ago, Dr. Ben Carson name was removed from a Michigan school during that remove names from buildings movement. Dr. Ben Carson is not a Confederate soldier, but he fell into that, that movement of removing names. The reason why they removed Dr. Ben Carson's name because Dr. Ben Carson was working with Donald Trump, with Donald Trump. He was part of the Trump administration. I think he was like Secretary of Housing or something like that. So Dr. Ben Carson, name was removed from the school. Let me tell you why this is problematic. <sighs> Dr. Ben Carson's story, and the, and the two other men I mentioned too, Thomas Sowell and Clarence Thomas, these stories of these men are... Stories of influence, stories of inspiration that could be used that a black person who will see a person who went through what they went through could use it for fuel to get to where they need to get to. Or these stories of inspiration perhaps could be for like Dr. Ben Carson's story, stories of single parenthood of a mother who made choices to make her son to be in a position that he's in working for the president. Let's talk about Dr. Ben Carson first. Dr. Ben Carson, like I said, was born in Michigan, right? Parents divorced. Now he's at a single home, single parent home. His mother has a third grade education. So she's working as a domestic worker. You know, I guess a maid, cleaning up here and there. Ain't no real money in that. So she had to work multiple jobs. Dr. Ben Carson was not doing good in school. She implemented a plan for Dr. Ben Carson to learn how to love learning. You're a self-made man. You're a self-made professional. And it all reverts back to when you watched too much television and your mom sort of said that's not the way it goes. Can you take us back to those days? Even though she only had a third grade education, 
and worked extraordinarily hard, two to three jobs at a time, cleaning other people's houses because she refused to go on welfare. Uh, because she never saw anybody go on and come off of it, so she didn't want to start that lifestyle. And uh, she noticed in the houses that she cleaned that those people didn't sit around watching TV all day. That they had a tendency to do a lot of reading and studying and strategizing. So after asking God to give her wisdom, she came home with the idea that that's what we were going to do. We were going to turn off the TV and we were going to start reading and give her written book reports, which she couldn't read, but we didn't know that. And um, I was not happy, and that would be a, a, a significant uh, understatement. Um, everybody else was outside having a good time, and there I was uh, reading books, I think. But, you know, after a few weeks, something strange began to happen. Uh, I knew I was going to have to read them anyway, because, you know, back in those days, you had to do what your parents told you. and. Um, as I started reading them, I started knowing things that nobody else knew. And it was really kind of cool, because I used to really admire the kids in class who always knew the answers. And I would be sitting there saying, how do they know that? How do they know so much stuff? I don't understand how they know all this stuff. And then all of a sudden, I knew the stuff. And all of that began to translate into a much better academic performance. And I began to really change my opinion of who I was. And, uh, you know, having grown up in dire poverty, the thing that I hated the most in life was poverty. I just hated poverty. But as I began to read those books, particularly about people of accomplishment, uh, I began to realize that poverty was really more of a choice than anything else, and that I could change that. Uh, and it just really depended on how hard I wanted to work. She had this man, or this boy, reading two books a week, had to read two books a week and give her book reports on each one of the books. That right there gave Dr. Ben Carson a struggling student into a person who had confidence in learning. So confidence in learning and also from the books that she was suggested for Dr. Ben Carson, a person who didn't do good at school, who got pushed by his mom to start reading more, or from reading more, he started to love learning and from reading more, he got inspiration to get into medicine. And he did so good in school, he got a scholarship to Yale. Then after that, he became a neurosurgeon, became one of the best neurosurgeons of all time. But so a story of a boy who was in a single parent household, who mom didn't graduate school, who worked as a domestic worker, cleaning up, Lord knows what, put in a play for her son to love learning, for him to become the best neurosurgeon in the world. That story is not told, or that story is not even passed down because of his political affiliation. All the, all the stories of black single motherhood who trying to figure it out could be inspired by this. All the stories of black boys being raised by single mothers could be inspired by this. But how come this story is not a story of inspiration? because of a label that the terms and condition was put on to us for this man. And not to mention, you taking down the name of Dr. Ben Carson off of a school with that kind of a story. Not only his name should still be on the school, it should be a plaque with that story in front of the school so kids could see that and be inspired like, wow, somebody who looked like me, that's from here, that perhaps have a similar situation with a single parent did this and got his name up here. Not everybody could be LeBron James. Not everybody could be a, a gifted athlete. But everybody could learn. You know what I'm saying? Everybody could learn. You just have to learn how to learn. Everybody has the capacity and the capability of learning and implying what you learn to do what you want to do. Dr. Ben Carson is a perfect example of that one of the best neurosurgeons of all time. But since he worked with Trump, you took his name over school and y'all want to dismiss what he went through to become who he is. Before we continue with the content, man, I want to make an announcement. Every last Wednesday of the month, we will be going live. Make sure you guys are subscribed, turn on notifications so you know about the live streams. Also, during those live streams, 
I will be doing a giveaway. So this is the giveaway we're doing. For channel members, for Tradition Breakers, you guys will get a chance to win a Broken Traditions hoodie. So like the hoodie you see right here, the Broken Traditions Simplistic hoodie, you guys get a chance to win this hoodie. Each month, I'm gonna draw a random name from the Broken Traditions tribe members, from the trap for the Tradition Breakers. These hoodies are great hoodies, they feel good. People who've been buying them say they love the way they feel, they love how they are. Since hoodie season's coming up, I wanna give you guys a chance to win one. Now, people who submit the emails, right? You submit your email to Broken Traditions, doing the same thing for email submission, but you're not with hoodies, with t-shirts. So you submit your email, www.brokentraditions.com. You could win a Broken Traditions t-shirt. So now in the live streams, live stream gonna be once a month, we're gonna talk about trending topics, maybe episodes. And during that time, I wanna hear from you guys. You guys wanna call up, call up to the show, or you wanna cam up, cam up to the show, what have you. Either way, I want to hear from you guys. I want your input. This is an online community. It's not just one person. So I want to hear from you guys. All right, let's get back into this content. I want to take it to another story. Judge Clarence Thomas. I understand people don't like him because his stance on affirmative action. But to dismiss what he went through to become who he is is criminal. If you think Dr. Ben Carson's story was inspirational, Clarence Thomas was born in Pinpoint, Georgia in the 40s, Jim Crow South. His father left him when he was two. His mother, also a domestic worker, uh, uh, was like a maid or a janitor cleaning up. She couldn't, she couldn't take care of him. He had to go live with his grandparents. Live with his grandparents. That's when they started to steal the love of learning and discipline in his Catholic, Catholic faith. So a man that lived in Jim Crow South. Father left him. Mother couldn't take care of him. Had to be raised by grandparents. Went through what he went through to become who he is. A Supreme Court judge. Now, think about this. This is one of three black people in the history of this country to hold that title. One of three. Thurgood Marshall, Ketanji Brown Jackson, and Clarence Thomas. But out of those three, Clarence Thomas is the only one born in Jim Crow South. I think Ketanji Brown Jackson might have been born in D.C. and moved to Florida but it wasn't during Jim Crow. And I think Thurgood Marshall was born in Baltimore. Born in Jim Crow South. Also, out of the three, Clarence Thomas is the only one that was raised for a small bit of time by a single parent. They had to go live with his grandparents. The other two, uh, Marshall and Brown Jackson, both had both parents in the home. Not to take away from the accomplishments but what I'm saying is he had a different route, a route that some people have that feel discouraged, like they can't do something. This man did that in Jim Crow South. If he could do that in Jim Crow South, what could you do in 2024 under the same circumstances? What could you do being born in 2002, in 1992, in 1982? This man was born in 1948 in Jim Crow South couldn't get a job in my state of Georgia. So I came here and I was only going to stay a couple of years. This is a calling. I've never had any other dream but to return to Savannah, Georgia. That's, that's my number one dream. I couldn't get a job in my state of Georgia. It, it's that simple. I mean, some people make it very complicated. I could not get a job. And I looked at the firms in Atlanta, I looked at lots of places, I got zero job offers. Senator Danforth offered me a job. Jack Danforth, a good man. The biggest problem that I had with him is he was a Republican. But, <laughs> but I got over it when I had only had one job offer. <laughs> and so I came here and I was only going to stay a couple of years and then I was going to Savannah. I think I 
look back on those days that I came of age as the, the sort of the, the, the years that I will treasure because they were really, really hard. And he became who he became with those circumstances, with his father leaving him, with his mother couldn't take care of him, had to give him up to the grandparents. How is that in our story of inspiration? How that story is being pushed to the back burner because of labels put on the people because of the, the ideas and opinions and political ideologies, because he's against affirmative action? And the last man I mentioned, Thomas Sowell. I talked about Clarence Thomas being born in Jim Crow South. Thomas Sowell was born in Gastonia, North Carolina during the Great Depression. Thomas Sowell, too, was raised by a single mother because his father died before he was born. He didn't get a chance to even see his father. Father died before he was born. Mother couldn't take care of him. Had to send Thomas Sowell to go live with a great aunt. Thomas Sowell, one of the best minds when it comes to economics in this country, we don't have to put race into it, one of the best minds when it comes to economics in this country dropped out of school. Had to drop out of high school because he had to work to provide for his family because money wasn't coming in. Thomas Sowell went to the Marine Corps, got his GED, he got accepted to Howard University, then transferred to Harvard University, and graduated magna cum laude. Then he got his master's from Columbia. So you telling me a man born during the Great Depression dropped out of high school, had to go to Marines, took that route, got his GED, from the GED went to Howard, from Howard went to Harvard, from Harvard went to Columbia. But you don't want to use that story as inspiration? because of a label of the terms and conditions that was put on by somebody else. I mentioned three men that are always labeled sellouts, Tom's, um, bootlickers, uh, a mouthpiece for white supremacy, whatever it is that you put out there. But imagine a young boy who have to drop out, listening to a story like Thomas Sowell to see who he became. Imagine a young boy who mom can't handle him and seeing a story like Clarence Thomas. Imagine a young boy seeing a story that's struggling in school and see what Dr. Ben Carson became. Those three men. But instead, those stories of inspiration is not stories of inspiration because of labels that was put on. Same thing with Edie Nixon. Labels that was put on to a man who literally organized the most impactful the most impactful movement in civil rights. Who make the terms and conditions for sellouts? Who make the terms and conditions for coons? Who make the terms and conditions for bootlickers? For uh, auntie ruckuses? Shout out to Messi Michonne. Who make those terms and conditions? It don't make sense. It don't make sense because still sharp and still, a Thomas Sowell, a Dr. Ben Carson, a Clarence Thomas have a different opinion. Let's listen to their opinion. Let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. I'll, I'll give you another example of somebody that y'all do this to. Y'all did this to Mark Lamont Hill. Y'all throw out anything Mark Lamont Hill said because of his argument with Candace Owens. Because he said a man can have a baby. But he's talking not into biological terms. He's talking into terms of gender identity. Yeah. But I guess nothing else Mark Lamont Hill says makes sense. Same thing with Candace Owens. Because Candace Owens had a different opinions about um, George Floyd, anything else she says, you have to put a disclaimer out there if you agree with it. I like Candace Owens, but I don't like her politically. That's what Joe Buttons had to say. People may have one opinion about something that you don't agree with, but you should not throw that whole person away as far as what else they have to contribute. It, it's not 
it don't I don't know, it doesn't it doesn't equate to becoming a better person or breaking away from certain traditions because people literally put these terms and conditions out there. And I don't think the people who put the terms and conditions are part of the culture. You know what I'm saying? I think there are people who are extreme left-leaning, (laughs) purple-haired, extreme liberals. From not, I'm not even gonna say purple here, just extreme liberals who put this out there, who put it to our minds that you have to have this mindset. Gotta be careful about that. Gotta be careful. And I, I'll say this too. I think the people that we may read about and love in black culture and black history perhaps would be called sellouts to Tom's and Coons in today's time and with today's terms and conditions. I think a Booker T. Washington would be called that. I think of Malcolm X, if Malcolm X was alive and still had the same ideologies he had leading towards his assassination, would be called that. That's what I think. I think y'all would make those reasons for that to happen. You know, perhaps he was the same thing with Martin Luther King. I mean, if you live long enough, they're going to turn on you. J- Jim Brown, they turned on Jim Brown. Um, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, they turned on Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Like, they would turn on you if you live long enough or if you live in today's time. Appreciate y'all, man. Um, if you guys like this kind of content, please... Follow Broken Traditions wherever you find Broken Traditions. Also, I want to give a big shout out, man, to all the channel members that's either on Patreon or YouTube. Appreciate you guys. Appreciate channel members. Appreciate people who subscribe. Follow on um, Rumble, Facebook, YouTube, uh, Spotify, Apple, what have you, man. You know, I definitely appreciate you guys. You know, this is a, a conversation, man, I wanted to have. And let me know how you feel about it in the comments after listening to the whole conversation, right? So if you made it this far, put a, uh, uh, what is it, a, uh, a timestamp saying the word. I heard the whole thing. I appreciate that. All right, man, to next time. Peace. Real Rap Ron is signing off. All right, later. One.